Good evening, everybody. Suspect Sky here with the original Suspicious Observer, uh, a longtime friend and colleague in our mutual project of uh, attempting to bring alternative science uh, to the forefront of social media platforms. We're just coming back from the Observing the Frontier conference, which is a big success, uh, at which time we discussed a number of topics ranging from uh, genetically modified foods uh, to type 0.5 and above civilizations uh, and dark matter. So, Ben, great to have you here, man. Uh, what are you thinking about? Well, first of all, I just spent all day putting your uh, conference presentation video together, uh, m putting the narrated audio over the uh, slides you had, and so that is now posted uh, over on the Deeper Look section of suspiciousobservers.org. Uh, we do have six of those presentations up. Uh, the reason why I wanted to come on with you is because I had a couple uh, points and ideas I wanted to drop on some of the topics that you went over, and I really just, I, I don't know where else to put them other than your channel. Um, so I, I don't know how you want to get into this, or if you just want me to sort of break into the the ideas and topics here. Well, sure. So yeah, I'll, let me do a, a quick little intro. So uh and, and thank you. Yes, I know our, our channel's a little uh, more fringe, uh, which we like to be. But um, my talk at the most recent OTF was an attempt to categorically cover the history of what's known as the Kardashev scale, which has been extended, modified, uh, alternate scales have been proposed uh, by a number of famous uh, astronomers and physicists including uh, Michio Kaku, including Carl Sagan, uh, including uh, a, a number of uh, individuals. My personal favorite happens to be uh, an individual named Robert Zubrin, who came up with a, a way to scale the types of civilizations according to their ability to influence uh, large expanses of their environment. And from that, uh, we've essentially developed a modified scale for our little community here, uh, that's kind of a blend of the original Kardashev scale, which deals with the capability of a civilization to harness and capture energy, uh, with Robert Zubrin's scale, which is the ability of that civilization to influence its local environment. Uh, so when we talk about a type 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 civilization, we're using our modified scale. And you're able to uh, view that over at uh, the Suspicious Observer's website. You're able to, you're able to view that, that talk where we kind of sum up uh, where we're at with the scale. And the primary distinction between our scale and sort of the traditional Kardashev scale is where the traditional Kardashev scale looks at a type 4 civilization as being able to harness the entire energy of the universe. Our scale looks at a type 4 as being able to influence its local environment, which has now expanded to include a local supercluster of galaxies. Uh, so, as that being sort of an introduction into our scale, uh, please, you know, let, let me know your thoughts. I'm really interested. Well, I really like the scale. Uh, the thoughts are sort of uh, outside of the scale. I thought you did a great job describing all of that, and I thought that the time that you dedicated to the type point five. Uh, as as humans are basically that, um, I thought that that was that was really well done. Um, I, I want to bring up the the great void and this fast radio burst warp drive hypothesis because uh, you and I basically came up with that during a four minute conversation on the phone, and I really want to kind of put our stamp on that as well. So, uh, how do you pronounce this thing? The the Boetti's void, the the great void. Did I do that? Yeah, right? it, it is. It is Boetti's, and uh, I've gotten that wrong for about a year and a half, maybe two years, until a uh, a friend over in I believe Scandinavia uh, corrected me. So, uh, according to them, it is actually Boetti's void. All right, interesting. So you had had this idea that um, if you extend Hawking's warning about, hey, maybe we wouldn't want to attract attention, maybe we would, uh, in addition to not want to attract attention, maybe we would even want to hide our signals uh, from potentially malicious uh, extraterrestrial civilizations. And I'm sitting here and I'm staring at this void and I'm thinking to myself, all right, your idea of this covert dark, uh, I really like it. But there's one thing about this void that um, 
sort of requires perhaps uh, a different interpretation or a, a modified one. And that's the fact that this thing is just blatantly obvious out there in the middle of the sky. And so it, it's kind of it's kind of draws uh, any any intelligent civilization's attention to it. And what it got me thinking of was something still along your lines of wanting to remain this sort of covert, dark civilization. So if we take that idea that, hey, you really don't want to, to broadcast yourself, you want to hide if possible. Um, but yet this thing here, which would be a great example of a place to hide, uh, sort of draws one's attention if you're an intelligent species. So um, what if we get to the point where we realize that hiding it altogether is futile. Um, let's say, uh, just to take example, do you fear a your level civilization on your home turf? So let's say that uh, it's a couple of years and we get to the point where we could theoretically um, travel out to the stars, but you know we've got budget problems and we've got problems here on Earth as well. Um, and let's say that a civil, another civilization um, kind of does the same thing and they travel all the way here. Um, how much would we really fear another human level civilization on our home turf? Um, we'd really be fearing a more advanced civilization than ourselves and could you even really hide from that? Um, I think that would always be an open question. But what if there was a way that you knew for a fact you could have something like tinted windows? And so this void is 300 million light years in diameter. It's 700 million light years from Earth. We don't know what's in there because we can't see anything. But what if you still couldn't see anything at only one parsec away? What if you couldn't see anything at only one AU away? What if simply disappearing and being invisible to the universe is impossible. But you know that no matter what, you can put up this field of, or, or this cloud of stuff that's basically an approach if you dare. You don't know what's in here until you come in here. You don't know what level civilization it is. Maybe we're a type two and we're just praying that this scares you away, or maybe we're a type four and the moment you come in here, you're done. Um, I, I just thought that that needed to be brought up because I could see somebody taking a look at the Great Void and saying there's nothing really covert about this thing other than the fact that it shrouds what's inside of it. Um, and I think the notion of maybe you can't hide altogether or maybe um, you'd only want to fear more advanced civilizations. And I think it's an interesting idea of maybe this approach if you dare, you don't know what's inside here kind of thing. Um, I think that's an awesome point, uh, because when you think about these huge super civilizations that Kardashev predicted, uh, Kardashev predicted that because population expansion is a natural tendency for a civilization, uh, and so is expansion, that we're going to require ever greater energy consumption in order to support our ever-expanding civilization, and that by nature, we can't help that. Uh, you know, it's exponential. And... Because of that, we're going to start using ever greater energy resources, and according to some of the best minds out there, it's going to have to be, uh, once you reach a certain level, it's going to have to be tapping into the energy levels of local stars and perhaps even your entire local supercluster uh, if you're a sufficiently old civilization. And a point on that is when you consider how many billions of years old the universe is, uh, it's highly likely that we are a very young uh, race uh, in our infancy and that there is likely very old civilizations out there uh, that are much more sophisticated, much larger than us. Uh, and if by nature we can't help but tap into greater energy reserves, uh, and you know, my, my theory was that they would produce this sort of covert dark attempt uh, about hiding not only their visible light spectrum, but also their infrared and the other uh, spectrums of light to the best that they could, producing perhaps a Boetti's void. But you bring up this great point that, that this is kind of obvious. Uh, and the only way really to couple that with uh, being obvious is approach if you dare. You know, you don't know if we are a more advanced civilization than you or not. I mean, 
short of geographically, it looks a lot bigger than, say, a Type 3. But if you're a nearby Type 4, uh, you might not know what decimal level they are at on the Kardashev right, scale and might right. ch- might choose to, to avoid it. Yeah, that was my thinking exactly. And then so I start to think about, all right, so how would we even begin to think about shrouding what we've already done? And then I think about the fact that it might, it, you know, it's physically possible that it could take more energy to shroud uh, your use of a star than it you could actually get from the star. Um, and what if, you know, totally hiding everything wasn't really practical, but doing this sort of tinted windows approach, if you dare thing, might might make some sense. I think you, you described it absolutely perfectly there because, you know, if I'm a type 3 civilization and I want to go in there, I, I, I need a new place to go. I've explored just about everywhere I can get to, uh, but I want to know what's in there. I don't know if it's a bunch of type 2s or if there's a type 4 civilization in there. It, it, it's a... It's a huge, huge risk point for an entering alien civilization to that area. It, it basically ups the risk, um, and you know, it, it, it parlays off the fact that I imagine the more energy you use, the greater your civilization expands, the harder and harder it gets to hide the thing as well. Um, so, um, unless your technology advances so much that. Right. hiding your energy transmission becomes ever easier, uh, which I think is a point that that G-infrared survey we discussed uh, kind of missed. You know, he yeah. kind of assumed yeah. that they would be using kind of recycling and waste heat technologies that we would find today when, in fact, it might be something more analogous to uh, perfect symmetry between uh, waste heat and the and the vacuum space behind it. Yeah, and you know, that actually also brings up an interesting point. So let's say we would adopt this idea that we do want to, to shroud ourselves. Let's say we become a type um, a type 2 civilization, and we could basically master the entire solar system or affect the entire solar system, but we need to use a bunch of that energy to, to shroud ourselves as well. And so we, we can't quite manage shrouding ourselves and managing the whole solar system. Uh, and so we would have technically attained type 2, but our choice of how we use that energy might not display that we are a type 2. Um, I, I don't know, just a bunch of interesting ways to go about it. What I really wanted to talk about here is I, I need to make sure that you and I get some proper claim on this FRB warp drive hypothesis because this started with you bringing up the light sail thing and then... Um, I talked to I moved us into the the Can-A drive and then you and I quickly got into this idea of you know this Can-A drive or the the EM drive the, the M drive these electromagnetic drives are basically looking at at warp speed and so you basically the simple version is you hit these things with some radio waves in the right way and it creates measurable thrust. It's been now confirmed and repeated a number of times, including in a vacuum, which uh, eliminates the ion wind possibility uh, for error. So, so that wasn't it either. Uh, but it, if I could just maybe explain what this is. Uh, so I can basically put uh, our claim on this idea because I think I, I can adequately describe it quickly in a way that everyone will understand. Um, the idea would be that fast radio bursts could be advanced civilizations using this type of radio frequency drive technology at a much greater scale than we have to attain something like warp speed. And the idea is that um, there's three great uh, uh, reasons for this as a as potential. One, it explains the fast radio burst signature, first and foremost. One, we're talking about the same spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. We're talking about radio waves. This, uses, this requires uh, radio wave input, and we detect, um, you know, this, these FRBs, they're in the radio spectrum. And then the ramp up and drop off 
as it ex as you know the warp drive craft exceeds the speed of light is pretty much exactly how you'd see an FRB signature when they hit warp you know when they hit the warp drive you know turned it on you see this blast of radio frequency now normally um, you would expect to see that thing staying at that high level or perhaps even increasing its uh, in its energy levels except as this thing starts moving away from you the energy that you receive is going to be lower and lower and once it breaks light speed you will have no uh, signature from it whatsoever and who's to say that that couldn't be attained in just you know a couple of milliseconds uh, over the time of a fast radio burst so number two it could explain both the transients and the repeaters uh, transient ones ones that never repeat those could be explorations to new places um, you know, mining operations on, on something where, you know, it, it's not like travel there, uh, you know, back and forth is that uh, normal. But then you have repeaters, and those could be hubs, spaceports, or checkpoints, which also could explain the, the dispersion measure correlation and would give a reason for why you would see these things at these multiples of distance. Because what I mean, if those were checkpoints, it almost suggests like it's a structured transportation network. All right, you get here. Does it show that you've gotten here in the amount of time that you were supposed to? Did you make any other stops? Maybe you weren't supposed to make. Um, you know, check in. Make sure you've got all the cargo. Make sure you got all the crew. Things like that. It 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 really sort of uh, offers up that idea. And so. I, I don't know enough about FRBs. Like I know that there's some special spin to some of them, and I know there's some other characteristics. But so, what else is there about fast radio bursts that we need to use our heads and say, does this warp drive hypothesis jive with it, or or does it fit? You know, does do we need to do we need to maybe rethink this? I mean, what am I missing in terms of the characteristics of a fast radio burst that could be compared with a potential warp drive? I think you've nailed uh, a number of things on, on the head here. Uh, first being the, the regular space distance. Uh, so that, for, for the audience who've been following uh, this channel for a while, you know is a dispersion measurement, uh, which, oddly enough, has been uh, uh, correlated to the number 187.5, which is this sort of standard separation. And it's unusual for us to expect to see equally space distanced uh, phenomena occurring in our universe. Uh, it correlates very well to the concept, uh, as you said, Ben, of an equally spaced sort of transit hub system. Right. Another thing you mentioned was the um, uh, was the the enormous spike in energy, and then the enormous fade away of it. Uh, and whether that is the effect of a propulsion system reaching some kind of maximum thrust. Uh, I'm not sure would really matter because I would look at that sort of spike and then quick drop down as being it simply has moved beyond our field of view so quickly uh, that we are now out of the signal. Right, you know that's uh, a, field of vision. Man, that's a great point. So the way I described it, all right. So you know the scenes in Star Wars or Star Trek, you know whether you're talking about the Millennium Falcon or whatever. Uh, where they hit the warp drive and it looks like they just disappear straight out away from you into the distance. Um, that's really interesting because my idea would be that, okay, pretty quickly they get up to light speed. And the moment they hit light speed, your fast radio burst is over. You, 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 don't, you don't have any more visibility of a fast radio burst. But the, uh, there's also this idea that what if they're going across y y your horizon? So they're not going directly away from you, but they're going across. That would completely explain the the transients as well, or or the 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 signature of an F R of an FRB, the ramp up and drop off, because the moment it almost instantaneously after hitting the you know the, the the radio frequencies, this thing would no longer be where you were detecting the FRB before. Yeah, and that would be true even for uh, sublight, however extremely fast speeds as well. Right. Uh, so if you were going 0.3 uh, C, you know, a third of the speed of light, uh, if you were going in any slight angle away from our field of vision, we would we would observe a similar spike uh, as we do with the FRB. Huh. Interesting. All right. Um, so. 
are all of the FRBs polarized like this? We don't know. Okay. Uh, We've been able to detect, uh, I believe it was 40% polarization, 60% polarization, and then one or two that might have been even close to 100% polarization. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so um, I'm just reading through some of the other things here. Um, yeah, so there, there are two detected properties, uh, linear polarization and Faraday rotation. And do we expect all of them to be extragalactic in origin? We know that for a fact. Okay, now that's that's something I would not expect. It would basically suggest that whatever kind of civilization was using this would basically have have not we haven't had one make it there in this galaxy. Well, you know, I guess that's that's feasible. Yeah, it's an interesting question why we don't see any FRBs nearby. Uh, some people have created the analogy that if an FRB were to go off in our Milky Way galaxy, it would be such an intense burst of radio frequency energy, it would be analogous in the visible spectrum of being brighter than the sun hmm. in, in, our, in our daytime sky. Uh, so it's if one of these things happened in our galaxy, it would be very, very obvious. Okay. And perhaps we are more of an of an infantile galaxy, uh, and so are the ones around us. We don't know. Maybe this technology is reserved for the uh, the very ancient. Uh, you know, most FRBs are picked up uh, one to three billion light years away, and that's plenty of time for what we consider to be super advanced civilizations to have evolved. Uh, it's it's a good question, uh, or maybe it's just not allowed in our local uh, community here. Yeah. <laughs> you never really quite know. Yeah, there also might be a thing where you have to point your because it, it's weird. The 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 thruster kind of looks like a cone, such that you could point where you get this thrust. And I would imagine that the radio frequency, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know whether or not when a fast radio burst happens, it's visible from everywhere in the universe, or it's only visible from a, a few lines of sight, but. Um, if we are, I, I, I would, I would say it's the latter. You have to be in the field of view okay. of it. Well, if that's the case, we would want to make sure that, you know, it, just being nice to any potentially developing species, um, that we didn't point this thing, at, you know, we didn't blast off in any direction that would have the burst going directly at a nearby galaxy or or something like that, which really would not be that difficult if you think about it. Um, it, it could also be just random chance, you know, as we spin around our universe and our galaxy and, you know, it only lines up a few times every once in a while uh, where the cone of the thruster is, is perfectly timed and in the perfect alignment to hit us, uh, you know, a billion light years later, uh, whenever it reaches us, uh, you know, it, it could be a very rare event. And I, I do not think uh, that they are spherical in nature, such as a, a, a bursting wave, like a shock wave out of a sphere. Uh, I don't think we would observe the same drop, uh, the same uptick and drop off of the signal that we observed if it was a spherical, uh, a spherical signal in nature. Have there been? Uh, have are all FRBs about the same energy, or do they vary widely in energy? No, they, they, they all uh, exhibit a similar intensity of energy, and the vast majority of them come in uh, at 1.4 gigahertz frequency. Uh, there's only been two anomalies out of the, say, 50 of them uh, that come in below 1.4 gigahertz. They came in around 800 uh, megahertz, oh, which is slightly lower, and those, those are two anomalies. And uh, another interesting thing about the 1.4 gigahertz is that's actually the uh, frequency at which SETI looks for uh, to identify potential alien signals because it exists on what we call the hydrogen line, which is the frequency at which hydrogen resonates, mm -hmm. uh, which is also further interesting because the Harvard physicist article that we looked at with light sails uh, identified that that frequency would be ideal uh, for use in propelling uh probes using a type of light sail, that it had sort of the best optimal uh, pressure 
on uh, such an object if we were trying to use electromagnetic radiation as a propulsion system. Interesting. That's very interesting. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to bring up about this, and this is probably something we'll have to think of more later. But it might be a good, it might be a good. Hey, it's something cool to think about as as we sign off before we take up too much of everyone's time. Um, but there's a um, peak irradiance flux number given for every fast radio burst, um, and they go as low as the one. Uh, uh, what looks like uh, in 2001, October 25th, um, at about 0.3 Jansky, up to the Lorimer burst, which was 100 times stronger at 30 Jansky. And then there was the one 2015, uh, August 7th, which was anywhere from 90 to 150 Jansky. So we're talking about, you know, times a thousand, three orders of magnitude difference in some of these things, it might be worth considering whether or not this is an accepted, uh, you know, a generally accepted uh, means of transportation, but you can only go so fast based on what type of, what type of civilization you are. And so something like the Lorimer burst uh, in 2001 would have been from like a type three zipping around and something like uh, most of the ones we see would be from the more numerous type two civilizations zipping around at you know vastly vastly lower Jansky levels. Which again, I, I want to make sure I, I say this properly so I don't. All right, so it's it's a unit of spec, uh, spectral flux density or spectral irradiance used especially in radio astronomy. Um, one Jansky is equivalent to ten to the negative twenty six watts per square meter per hertz. Um, and so there's a couple of things involved in this. Um, but so going back to that, it looks like uh, it is not necessarily just based on duration. There's something about the actual radio burst of energy that um, is maybe more intense. And I think that might be something to look into or at least have a fun little mental discussion about. Well, to me, it sounds uh, sounds very analogous. If, if we assume the hypothesis is correct, that these are artificially produced uh, propulsion systems, that if you are a type 1, you're able to produce so much energy. If you're a type 2, you're able to produce so much energy. And then you would pick up sort of clusters of this signal used in transportation dependent on the size of your civilization and the energy you're able to capture. Yeah. Uh, so there'd be a lot more type twos who can only do, you know, maybe uh, a fraction of what a type three or a type four could do uh, with such a propulsion drive. That's really interesting. I, I think I'm going to think about that different spectral uh, irradiance flux uh, a little bit more. I, I, I've, I've spent a little bit of time while you were explaining last time looking into some of the different characteristic features of fast radio bursts, and I can't find anything that violates the warp, uh, the warp drive hypothesis. Um, I think uh, my brain is about to explode, but I definitely want to thank you for, for, for giving me a place to, to share this stuff because it's really not my website and it's really not my channel that's the appropriate place for, for some of these discussions. It's, it's kind of here. So, Well, absolutely. Always a pleasure to have you uh, on and we always look forward to uh, kind of the, the neat sort of cutting edge uh, discussions that we have. You know, it's always fun to share on this channel for sure, uh, even though it might not be your bread and butter content. And if, if I might just want to encourage uh, uh, the audience to check out the suspiciousobservers.org uh, page and uh, check out the recent talk uh, that I did called the Type 0.5s, uh, whereby uh, Ben and I kind of introduced this idea that uh, we are a civilization that is very low on the civilization scale, and we're already uh, successfully testing what NASA refers to as an M drive, uh, what has been independently invented uh, by another individual called the Kinet drive. Uh, they operate very similarly. And both drives use high powered radio frequencies to produce thrust without uh, a propellant. Uh, so you would not need to carry fuel with you uh, if you traveled space using such a technology. And when you put that in a perspective with uh, how old and how advanced some civilizations might be, there might be a very interesting tie-in to this continually inexplainable phenomenon that we call fast radio bursts, which just happen to be extremely powerful bursts of radio energy. Um, 
So I don't know, Ben, any final thoughts before we sign off? I think that was very, very well said. Maybe we'll come back to this uh, at another time. But thanks again, my friend. All righty. Everybody, uh, to the audience, have a good evening, and thank you for listening.